Well, good evening, everybody. Wow, that's uh, my mic is a little weird. Well, there we go. Good evening, and I appreciate you guys tuning in tonight. Dalen is not here. We do have a very special guest. Let's uh, have that guest introduce himself. Who are you, sir? David, thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, I'm Chris Barrett. You mean as in uh, Chris Barrett from Barrett Firearms? Oh, I, I don't know that guy. No, yeah, different guy, that, same guy. I'm well, the same guy. I think we are incredibly, incredibly lucky to have Chris in studio tonight, picking up where Dalen's left off. And I think Dalen's like having a birthday party or doing some fun thing that would be nice for me to do as well. But I, I seem to always have to work on my birthday. I don't get the day off like all my employees, but that's all right. It's that's the curse, right. man. It's, it's the something curse. like that, isn't it? It is. So, you know, I figured tonight, you know, there's a little bit of politics that we can get into. We can kind of do that morning rant. And um, then we can kind of get into Barrett Firearms and really learn how the company got started, where the backgrounds are, and where you guys are going, all the exciting things that are taking place. The NRA. Yes, sir. I think we always, I, I guess I should step back a second. On the show, we always talk about kind of structure and how to get going with what you're going to do politically. You know, get to know your neighbor, get your subdivision up and running, understand who the people are there, be organized, have regular meetings, back your candidate, learn and understand who your candidate is. Right. We, we do those steps and then you roll it out to a larger and larger market and you can do that for local elections, national elections. And this next election season that's coming up really quick on us, I think, is the defining moment in the United States. It very well could be if we, we felt like that about every one of the last few. But this is um, this is very serious. This is that tipping point. And there's a book out there called The Tipping Point. And everybody should read it because. This is, I think, that moment, and I think if you've never been involved in politics before, this is the one time, the one election, you have to be involved. Absolutely. And you started on the NRA. Yeah. Uh, and talking about the NRA. and That's that central point. That's mm -hmm. that, that organization that brings everybody together. They have the power in the belief system of what we all feel as conservatives, mm -hmm. and instead of having us conservatives eat our lunch and eat everybody else's lunch and destroy ourselves back an organization that has the goals and the feeling of you as a conservative, you may own one gun. You may be like some of us and have you know, hundreds of them, right? Your own private safe. No that's comment. like a, uh, a gun vault in a bank, but in your bedroom or in some hidden doorway. Right. And so, no matter which way you are, or if you live in a place like Los Angeles, where I grew up, and it's really hard to have a gun, period, and the laws and the restrictions are way against all of our rights and Second Amendment and everything we believe in, or you live in the communist north where our radio show goes, you know, up in New York and Massachusetts for those just ridiculous, ridiculous gun laws, the NRA, I believe in my heart, I'm a... I can't tell you, I don't know, I've been a member for so many years, I can't even look back and, and count. And I know you guys are involved in the NRA. A, a little bit. Just, yeah. a, just a little bit, right? Yeah. And so I think that is an organization where everybody who does not currently belong needs to belong. I believe there's somewhere between three and five million members. Mm-hmm. And there's something like 100 million gun owners. Right. So it's very few people fighting the fight for all of us. We need to get that 3 to 5 million number to 25 million to 35 million and carry a bigger stick. Absolutely. We will, we will be unbeatable then. And, you know, I'm afraid, um, I'm afraid of the image that the NRA has with all people, uh, with all gun owners. Uh, you know, some people may not understand the full depth of what they do every single day. You know, we see one side of the NRA and the mayors that we get or the, the, um, we see them on, in, in, in the media, but we really don't know the fight that they fight every day and how committed and sold out they are. I think how we are actually, I every, say, they, it's us, exactly you know? every, every person listening to this show needs to go to the NRA website mm -hmm. and do their research 
on the NRA, learn about the NRA, see their political action committee, see what they do legislatively, look at what they do with these major lawsuits and how they fight for us and how those lawsuits protect everything that we love. And I think we kind of take our life for granted as an American, but that life is slipping away. Mm -hmm. And so many people, I think, are afraid to stand up for their rights, not knowing what will happen. And I think it's really important because I say this a lot, but Democrats go to the streets and they're paid to go to the streets, right? Bloomberg and all these guys, they flush out the cash and pay people to get on buses and show up five states away and they do it Mm -hmm. because either they don't have jobs or they're committed, right? right? One of the two, but they still get them out. Right. Republicans go to work. Conservatives go to work. We take care of our families. We're, We're deep in the community. We really involve ourselves in in a place like Williamson County or Rutherford County or, you know, it's just we're not willing to risk our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. We're not willing to take that time separate and away from our daily life to commit to an election season or to commit to the NRA and to go to events and to really understand what's taking place. You know, I'm on the radio here, but I think Mark Levin is a great radio host. He has phenomenal books. He really knows his stuff. He was a constitutional attorney. He was in the Reagan cabinet. He worked, I believe it was for Ed Meese. Um, You know, I mean, listen to guys like that. Listen to people that really have that depth of understanding and read that guy's books. There's a book out there called Battlefield America written by a constitutional attorney. He says, we're in Nazi Germany, 1936. Hmm. We're just before it gets bad. Agreed. It's unbelievable. You know, people over the last few weeks have been just jumping for joy over the court decisions here, pushing back against Obama with his whole thing of creating green cards and making citizens out of illegals and the court standing up for our rights as Americans. But how many times has the court not stood up for us? Mm. Right. Do we have socialized medicine? I think so. Yeah. What happened to the court? The court didn't save us there. So we need the opportunity to have an organization like the NRA that's as strong as they are, carry as big a stick as what they do, but they need help. I've got to say, you know, your recommendation to get to their website is excellent, but you really eventually have to commit to coming to an annual meeting. I, I don't think you can really understand who the NRA is. When you first come to an annual meeting, I know you were at this last one in Nashville. Obviously, it was convenient for all of us. When you come to an NRA annual meeting, you will see that this is not a special interest group. These are... This is your interest group. This is us. This is... It's an American interest group. It's what conservatives stand for. And they are good people. These people walking around, uh, you know, regular NRA members are families. They're men with their children, women with their children, uh, you know, passing on tradition and uh, and their rights to their children. And, and they're what, trying to keep America alive. Th- they really are. So you, if you've never had the opportunity to get to an NRA annual meeting, you absolutely must do that. You get the opportunity not only to see who the membership is, but you see, uh, you know, some of the candidates that are willing to stand up for the right side. And you look around the room and there are people just like me, just like you, just like you listening at home on the radio or driving in your car. That's right. But the candidates that go, as you're just about to say, you know, they're really putting themselves out there. They are not, they are walking the walk. They're not just, they're not giving some fancy speeches. They are down there on the floor with us. And the NRA did not pay us to do this. And when we come back, we're going to find out all about Barrett Firearms. We'll see you soon.
Welcome back, everybody, to the Everything Weapons Hour. And as we get going here, I just really want to go back and say that was not a paid commercial for the NRA in any way. That's in our hearts, and the NRA is who we are. And the people that are on the boards of the NRA, they don't get paid for that. That's because they feel it's important, and that's who they are. Um, Also, by the way, don't forget, June 6th is Glock Shooting Day at Everything Weapons Indoor Shooting Range. Um, we've got the new 43s. You can come out and shoot. If you want to buy them, we'll have some there. But come out and enjoy and shoot all the Glocks you want. Let's talk about bear firearms. All right. Let's, My favorite subject. Let's kind of, yeah, I could imagine so, right? So don't forget to call in if you guys want to call 615-737-WLAC or 1-800-688-WLAC. Questions, questions, questions. Feel free to call in and talk to Chris. How'd you guys start? What what was the beginning of the beginning? Oh, you know, you know that's really my my father's story, but uh, I was there the whole time, so <laughs> I almost remember the whole thing. So it was you know when I was a very young child. But my my father was a um, is just a creative genius. He is uh, he's not a trained mechanical engineer uh, or anything like that. He just knows and feels guns, and, and I gotta say I, I kind of do too. That's what I do. Uh, so my dad started, um, it, my dad was a photographer, so he's always been very artistic and creative, uh, but was always a shooter, always a, a gun man, you know, and, and owned machine guns and owned all kinds of interesting things. Not really into the traditional old hunting rifles and was not a, not really a hunter either, just had a fascination for the history of military firearms and, and liked to, like to use them uh, like a lot of us do. So, uh, just kind of. You know, it, this could be anybody, really. This is any of us that are, that are intrigued with uh, with guns and are a part of this shooting culture. So, dad was into dad was into all this and uh, and came up with the idea for this fifty caliber rifle, which is absolutely ridiculous. It's 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 totally improbable that you could make a uh, a fifty caliber rifle that you can fire from your shoulder and it not kill you. You know, and and I think everybody thought that. And uh, now we have engineers that come up with sophisticated modeling programs to try to predict all of the dynamics that might happen in a rifle like but that. But not back then. Not not then. You know, this was 1980, 1981, and, and Dad just knows that stuff. He just— So he had the it. idea, I think you could have a shoulder-fired, handheld 50 cal. Right. And just sat down and mapped it out. And people thought it was absolutely ridiculous, the idea, you know, but but he knew it could be done. And, uh, you know, he did. The the story is much longer than this, obviously. I mean, there's all kinds of trials that people go through. We're going to have to have your dad in one night. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) he can can really tell it, you know, but it's uh, but I was there. uh, You know, I was Mm -hmm. born in 78. So from the very from the very early parts, I've kind of some of it's a little foggy, obviously. But, um, you know, he just persevered and pressed on uh, through all of the challenges that an entrepreneur goes through. And, And boy, there were some tough ones, but he did it. And it's kind of. It's really the last story of an American gun designer inventor to do this on his own. It, this came from his mind onto a onto a napkin and out of the garage. That's fantastic. It, it, it really is, and uh, you know I may take that for granted every day, just growing up in this and being always being a part of it. But it is really a fantastic story that a lot of people are encouraged to hear. So I'm sure this led you to. You know, I'm sure there's all all young kids, cars and wanting your driver's license and, oh, yeah. you know, so that whole thing. But beyond the car thing yeah, and maybe drafting and designing and looking at stuff, are you a gun designer at heart? Like Absolutely. where? Yes, okay. Sir. You know, and, and everybody thinks that their dad is the coolest guy in the world. And, you know, my dad was shooting Uzis and M16s and M60 machine guns when I was a little kid. And I had a super cool 22, an AR-7 survival rifle there you are. that he made the stock for me. Uh, you know, it was just the length of pull. Have you ever seen one of these mm-hmm. things that, you know, the whole gun comes apart and goes into the butt stock? Right. It, was like a, it was an Air Force thing. So that was my first rifle. But that stock that comes with it is way too big for a little kid. So he and my uncles made a little small uh, stock out of wood that had a pistol grip. So it was a real assault rifle. And I was the, the coolest thing on the block. Yeah. Excellent. We do have a caller on hold, so let's take the call. Alexander from New Jersey. How you doing tonight? Good. How are you guys doing tonight? We're doing fantastic. Appreciate the call. What's your question, sir? Great. I kind of wanted to backtrack a little bit to, uh, to the uh, political stuff. 
Uh, my name is Alexander Ruby, and I'm actually the uh, president of the New Jersey Second Amendment Society. Now, uh, I'm not sure if you know, but for the past couple of years, they've tried banning 50 caliber rifles in New Jersey. Uh, last um, Two years ago, in 2013, I personally testified against it. Uh, as an organization, we put a significant amount of time and effort into making sure it didn't happen, and ultimately we were successful with the governor's office to veto it. Um, I did reach out to Barrett several times. Um, I, forgot the, I think it was Mitch that I spoke to in trying to get some type of support and see how we can work together in making sure this doesn't happen because for many of you, you know, many of you that know and involved in politics, what happens in New Jersey doesn't stay in New Jersey. Now, what have you guys done in regard to not selling firearms, as I know many other companies have, to states that have banned specific types of firearms or accessories to kind of politically influence and say, hey, we're not going to sell Barrett firearms to New Jersey law enforcement right. any- anymore because you guys don't support us and you're trying, you know, you have or will ban us. Right. Right? And I kind of want to know, like, how, uh, I mean, Barrett goes hand in hand with being probably the most recognized, most well respected, and, and, and best. 50 caliber rifle, even though yet I, um, I personally haven't had an opportunity to shoot it, but as a small organization in New Jersey that's done a tremendous amount of work in making sure specific firearms are not banned and whatnot, I mean, how can we work together and what have you guys done with other states or other organizations personally to make sure this doesn't happen? Oh, oh boy. A, a lot. And, um, and you know, I, ho- I hope you got some good support from Mitch. Mitch is a great guy that's been with us for a while. But, you know, everybody is familiar, or a lot of people are familiar with uh, our stance that we took with California. And, you know, that's been several years ago now, but I, I hope we started a bit of something with that. We had no idea what would happen at the time. But uh, in the case of California, the um, the LAPD themselves were involved in passing legislation that disarmed their citizens, that restricted the rights of their citizens. And and that's when um, my father, Ronnie, you know, uh, took the first stand there. They said, we are not going to support any government entities that willingly participate in the disarmament or the restriction of rights for their citizens. And uh, I, I'm not perfectly up to speed on every on everything that went down in New Jersey, but it's um, it's I, I guess the 50 cal is an easy target because it's the biggest, scariest looking thing. If that comes to pass, uh, what is the current state now? For the jersey he's, he's not. oh he's, he's gone now okay, yeah he's so. gone but you know I, I think the idea there is that anything that has to do with firearms and going against the second amendment everybody's behind from the nra to barrett to all of you know a lot of the firearms companies that are putting their foot down whether they're moving out of states mm-hmm. or you know they're just making their voice heard mm-hmm. i personally think that all these different Massachusetts companies and New York companies, and they all need to be out. Mm-hmm. There's no reason to stay there anymore. If they don't love you, why pay taxes to them so that they can fight you? It's sad, too, because we have quite a heritage of gun making up there. Yeah, but, you know, but hey, no we'll more. Take them. Times have changed. We Bring will, them here. We will take them down Tennessee here. Tennessee like wants it. them all. That's right. So let's talk about you. When did you start designing and developing guns, and what was the first gun that you really sunk your teeth into? I got real serious in the business in about 97 or 98. Okay. And uh, back then, my dad and I actually shared an office. I sat in front of his desk and, and um, well, you know, I, I say that, but actually at first I did a lot of uh, of the, the physical production of rifles. I mean, so I have experience in kind of every aspect of it. And I think that's a good, that's a good thing for a, especially for a child, a second generation child to come into the business. So you've worked on the machines and you've run the different... I can mess up almost any of it. I can do it all. <laughs> no, it's that's not really true. I'm I'm so lazy. I try to make everything easier and more efficient. So uh, that's I got to do my tour through the plant, and uh, I did identify several improvements in every area, and I like to implement things like that. So that was great. But then shortly thereafter, like in '97 and '98, uh, I started heavily working on gun designs, and I had been exposed to computer aided modeling or computer aided drafting, CAD as as people call it. And Barrett was not using that technology at that time. We were still on paper. So I bought the first, you know, computer-aided drafting computer and the software, and we, we went to work. And uh, that was 98. The, the first rifle design that I worked on was a uh, semi-automatic 338, 
which wow. is called the Model 98. And people, uh, you, you'll if you search on the internet for a Barrett Model 98, well, now you may see our new 98B bolt action, but you will see pictures of that semi-automatic rifle, and you may think that they're in production, or they were, but truthfully, we made one, and it it worked fantastic, or it was really the first time that we had ever seen a semi-automatic 338 Lapua Magnum. We tooled up to get into production of that. Uh, we were about halfway through, and um, a, a, a great need came up for Barrett to have a affordable or affordable for a Barrett single shot 50 caliber rifle. So we kind of backburnered that project for a while, and we went to the Model 99, which was my first full gun design uh, that actually came to production. And Pro- we still make it production today. design, right? Right. So that's our single shot 50 caliber. And truthfully, off of that rifle, uh, that rifle established the architecture by which we design all the the new products we have coming out. Most of them, the 98B, the MRAD, and some other things. That so that in the old out. days, were you guys welding stuff together, or were you CNC machining, or how was everything coming together? You know that the very first rifles, the Model 82 and the Model 90 bolt action rifle, were. I think before, for us anyway, they were before the days of accessible CNC machines. So those rifles, the, the architecture that Dad designed off there was primarily sheet metal fabrication. That means a lot of welding, sheet metal bending. So you'll see that the 82A1 is based on that type of uh, manufacturing process. And then subsequently the Model 90, which is now the Model 95, uh, very similar to the Model 82. The Model 99, my first rifle, we really departed from that that architecture and went with the more monolithic aluminum receivers, heavy CNC machining, really just changed the way we do things. That's fantastic. And when we get back, we're going to learn even more because this is a huge education for me. I'm going to become a Barrett expert after this, and I hope you guys are too. We'll see you in a few minutes. Hey guys, welcome back. And as we're continuing with Chris Barrett, want to really get into 
you know, where you guys are now, what are you doing now? What's that big project or one of your most recent projects that you can kind of say that was successful? I loved it. That was an incredibly fun project. Mm-hmm. Well, there's so much to go on here. We're, we are having, first of all, we're having a blast right now at Barrett. It is just, um, it's something new every single day. You know, the world is a big world out there and there's a lot of business in that. Uh, but the enhancements that we've made just to the company over the last few years operationally are just, for me, it's been a, a a lot of fun. So we've added a lot of great members to the leadership team. Uh, we pulled in some experience from, from automotive, uh, you know, another, another one of our VPs comes from the gun world and has a lot of experience there. And, and we've just got a great leadership team now that is, um, that's, we're really reshaping and reshaping the company and getting us ready for the charge forward for the next 10 or 20 years. I'm going to be excited to see it. I'm excited to learn about the rec seven. Okay. Tell me about this gun. How did that thing get developed? Was this something that you were chiefly involved in or how, how did, how do you say from an idea, what's the process kind of, do you have a whole design team that really gets involved? How does that work? At the genesis of the rec seven, not really. And it's, uh, you know, the small car being like that based off the AR M4 platform was not something that we initially envisioned ourselves being in, but like so many of the projects we get into, we were um, we were going off feedback from our users, and re- and just requests and what we were hearing from users. So some uh, special forces group, a special forces group uh, back in '04 came to us, and it was uh, kind of launched our foray into ARs was around the development of the 6.8 cartridge. That's what they were looking at then. We had never had any interest in in working with the AR platform. We knew there was room for improvement, but it was just not something that we were focused on because we were doing our thing with the the big guns. But we got into it because it sounded like an interesting idea. It's nice to see uh, to, to see people thinking about the enhancement of the lethality of the carbine. We were interested, and we got in. So we first actually made a direct impingement rifle. It was the M468. It was exclusively in 6.8 SPC. Not long after that, you know, when you start dealing with one of these rifles uh, with the M4 platform, uh, you see a lot of room for enhancement, which we have seen like crazy over the last 10 years out of the industry. You know, you would, if we could roll the clock back 10 or 20 years, you know, you could buy a Armalite, a Bushmaster, or a Colt. And they were all kind of mil-spec-ish rifles. Now The minimum requirement the military will accept. Correct. <laughs> you know, it, wants to build to the minimum. You know, and, and back, Colt, Bushmaster. And back then, people thought mil-spec was good. Like, people mm-hmm. used to go on AR15.com and go through the mil-spec checklist. You know, did it have this? Did it have stake this? Was it parkerized under the, under the front gas block? But we have so far departed from that now. We have we've just transcended that mil spec AR. You see it all through the industry with all of the uh, the ingenuity that's come out. We're constantly telling our customers because they go, "Well, is it mil spec?" And we ask, "So what's mil spec?" Yeah. Well, it's what the military accepts. Well, it's the minimum requirement, I, not the maximum requirement. You can have that if you're okay with that. But if <laughs> exactly. not, you can have something. If you want a four hundred dollar Bushmaster, <laughs> have at it. I've, I've got to say, we were really early in the game on. Um, on some of those enhancements, uh, especially in the piston-operated stuff like the, the Rec. Seven that that came about, but it's just, uh, you know, maybe some other folks have eclipsed us in that now. Or eclipsed what Barrett was doing because that's what they do every single day. But we, I still believe we have the best system, and what we're doing with the Rec. Seven now, we are really re-energizing our focus on that whole platform. So you're going to see a lot more uh, variations of the Rec. Seven platform coming out. But going back to how we got started with it. You know, I started working with the rifle. I've I've been familiar with the AR-15 M16 my whole life, literally. And uh, you know, I, I knew I knew there was room for improvement. I really, the older I get, I don't want to clean a firearm. Do you? I like to shoot them. I I cannot say. I just brought enough. a bunch of stuff into my staff because I've had like five right hand surgeries. Right. And my hand kind of has a some sort of problem. I, I don't really want to get into, but it makes it hard for me to to clean or do fine motor skill type work. That's your so excuse. I don't clean guns. I have other people clean I, them. Wow. I have other not by choice, clean. but I have to. That sounds a little uppity, David. I'm just saying. I have other people. That <laughs> it's not them. uppity. Who, who loads them for you? You know, do you have a? Load? Yeah, no, I load them myself. But no. you know, like I said, five right hand surgeries. You know, it kind of is what it is. I'm on my eleventh surgery in five years, but I keep on ticking. So, uh, cleaning guns. You know, you look at the M4 system. You got to admit. You know, the direct impingement system. It does work. It's worked well for many years. It does get the job done. But again, I think it's kind of a, a minimum 
standard mm-hmm. requirement thing. It gets the job done, but that gun gets very, very dirty in the action. Uh, they are they can suffer some reliability problems when they get very hot as well. So tell me about the piston system that you guys developed. What makes your system different than, say, SIG or LWRC? Or is there any long stroke, short stroke? Simplicity and robustness and reliability. Okay. It's, uh, I am also a huge fan of the AK platform. I love the AK for its just brutal efficiency. And if you take an AK apart and look at it, you know, let's let's just draw one one similarity here between it and the Rec Seven. The piston in an AK that's connected to the bolt carrier. There's no rings. There's no small sheet metal laser cut delicate rings on a piston on an AK. That thing is an absolute hammer. It's just a working machine. I did not want piston rings on a Rec Seven. I wanted the piston to be one piece. Uh, you know, and less risk of breaking or having some some sort of malfunction. Absolutely, and, and those little parts they get lost when you're field stripping the gun and yeah, it's cleaning less, that and having that little. Yeah, it's like the spring flying off into the air and you never find oh, it again. We don't want that. You know, some piston operated ARs, the piston itself is like seven parts. Can you imagine you're cleaning this thing on the hood of a Humvee and part one of your piston falls down between the fender? I think that's why the military probably hasn't switched is Maybe because not. there's so many pieces. And if you break that piston, you don't have the choice of like IBM compatible, right? Right. Where you can take any part from anything and make it work. You've got to have that specific part from that specific that's factory. Right. And that's that just really does not work. That does not work in a battlefield. And so the Rec 7, I wanted a, um, I wanted a ultimately reliable and simple system. That could be serviced and maintained in the field. The piston on that has no no gas rings. Gas rings are kind of delicate, actually, and they wear out. And you don't need them. You know, it's you can either try to keep gas in with a gas ring, or you can let it go, like the AK does. And the Rec Seven just lets it go. And that's why the gun stays so clean for so long and continues to run. The the piston is one piece, and it's held in by a piston plug in the front. You remove it, one piston comes out in your hand, and that's it. It's. I, I, that's you know, how I like it. So a lot of companies, they talk about their short stroke, long stroke. What would you consider yours? It, it is a short stroke. So, uh, you know, the technical classification for a long stroke or a short stroke, a long stroke anything is something that recoils longer than the length of the cartridge itself. So anything under the length of a uh, of a 5.56 cartridge is a short stroke. And so that would have less problems with potential bar- barrel harmonic issues, or how does that work? Because I've heard a couple things from some gun people, some gun designers, I should say, that the long stroke piston can have an effect on barrel harmonics. And I went out and I spoke to one of the companies, I'm not going to say their name on air, at the SHOT Show two years ago, and I specifically asked them that question. And all they would come back is talk about first shot, and I kept talking about follow-up shot. Right. And there was a total disconnect in the conversation. So it was like I, I might have hit a sore point with them. So I keep trying to figure out, does that long-stroke piston have a barrel harmonic issue? I think it has. Or is there a different issue that I, you guys. I think it has a very small effect on the precision of the rifle, whether it is a long-stroke or a short-stroke. I, I know – the aspects of a of a rifle design or the or the manufacturing of the barrel that causes that that rifle to be precise or not, and I don't think the largest percentage of that precision or accuracy is related to those harmonics post bullet leaving. Okay, so if, hope, hopefully that wasn't too technical. No, no, no. But I think it's good to be technical sometimes. I think maybe sometimes we're not technical enough because we're concerned about. You know, losing people, right? But let's lose some people. Okay. Let's get into some serious yeah. kind of stuff right here. Yeah. Help me out with some of that precision stuff. Uh, you know, the the heart of a precision rifle or any rifle is this barrel. And that is where, you know, probably 90 or more percent of the mechanical accuracy of a firearm comes from is the construction of that barrel, its chamber as it is related to the bore. The, the size and dimensions of the bore, the quality of the bore, uh, those things are – if you start with those bad, you can't harmonic your rifle. Right. You I, can't fix anything else. You can't else. fix that. And, and those stupid – Good glass isn't going to help. Th- that's right. Or, or an AccuWedge or nothing is going to help that. So you have to have – that. that's where the money on a rifle should be spent is in the barrel. So tell me about your barrels. Our barrels are the best in the world. <laughs> All right. Enough said and done, right? At show We're over. good. <laughs> show over. So 
honestly, tell me about your barrels. How do you make your barrels? I, is that commercial? I'm asking my producer. I hear that music. We just got we're going to talk. And we're <laughs> too many commercials. We're going to find out about Barrett barrels when we get back. See you in a minute. Welcome back, everybody. 615-737-WLAC. If you're local here in Middle Tennessee and would like to talk to Chris, or 1-800-688-WLAC if you're in one of those other 27 states. Let's get back to barrels. Right. There's a lot of different kinds of barrels out there. Everything from super cheap barrels. You know, we get people that come in because we've got this great AR build center at Everything Weapons in Brentwood. And... It talks about, uh, I, I, I could build a gun for $200. And you could. You know, but <laughs> why would you want to, right. right? So let's talk about barrels being that most important thing to accuracy. Why do we want a cold hammer forged barrel? Why would we want a button cut? Why would we want all these different things? And what have you guys experimented with? Mm-hmm. And why have you made some of those decisions? The barrel is the heart of the rifle. It's where to spend your money. Uh, Barrett, you know, at Barrett, we have, with the full family of firearms we have now, you know, we make, they're not all the same application. So we make the 50 cal. We make a very high precision sniper rifle in the 98B and the MRAD. We have our carbines in the Rec 7. And we don't use the same type of barrel in all of those because, you know, maybe one thing is not, right for every for everyone but different I can, requirements because of the size of the rounds and right. the distance you're shooting all that and, and you know kind of the uh the service schedule if you will of of the barrel so on our rec sevens uh, they have been our rec sevens are fitted with either button rifle barrels or hammer forged barrels depending on the caliber twist rate model whatnot okay so give me the life of a a button versus a cold hammer forge. You may not necessarily see, and I, I know you see a lot of claims about hammer forging, mm-hmm. about the long life of the barrel. Show me some data. And and that is a big problem. It's really a problem in our industry, it, you know, overall. Like people make all kinds of outrageous claims about coatings, lubrications, projectiles, but there's never any real third-party testing or data on this. Barrett has done a lot of this. And we have uh, our, the primary barrel we use in house because most of our rifles are long range precision rifles. We use single point cut rifle barrels. 
And the reason we use these barrels is... And these are all a stainless steel or... Most of them are stainless steel in the MRAD and 98B series. They're all stainless steel in the MRAD and 98B series. Uh, in the 82 50 caliber series, they're a chromoly, but they're all single point cut rifled. The reason we use those, they a single point cut rifled barrel from a, from a quality manufacturer produces the most consistent, excellent precision. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to back you up one second mm-hmm. cuz I'm sure we got 50 people waiting on hold right now that want to say I'm wrong. What is, no, 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 but that's not bad. Yeah. What is a button cut rifle? Okay. Right? And how how is that barrel made? The the three primary ways that we see barrel bores constructed here in the United States, we see button rifling or sometimes it's called um swaging, but this is where we push a very hard plug through a perfectly drilled and reamed hole in a barrel blank and that that plug or button if you will forms the rifling it swages it out so it actually presses that form into that and you can imagine this takes a tremendous amount of pressure they put a very specific grease inside that bore and push it through with a with a very specialized machine then, how do you know how long it takes to to complete a barrel, how long that process? It's re- that is a relatively quick process after the hole was made. Now, all three of these processes, the so hole, they drill the hole out first, correct, and then they and that's step one for every process. Okay, you drill a hole in a blank, and then usually, if it's a high precision blank, it's usually reamed and honed. So, it, so we're trying to make the hole as perfectly round and straight as possible. They all start that way. All three of these processes, the button gets a button pushed through it that swages or forms the rifle in, in there in or under a cold forming process. Uh, hammer forging is a, a very popular process, especially in Europe. The Europeans, the Germans, the Austrians, the the Finns seem to have perfected hammer forging. You don't see it as commonly in American gun makers, but it's becoming more so. But they really do this. HK, uh, they have become masters at forging. So they take a barrel blank that has a hole drilled in it. Its hole is actually larger than the caliber that it will be. It's a little bit larger. They put a Their button is called a mandrel. Is, is what's used in the hammer forging process. So a mandrel goes inside the bore, and a series of hammers hammer the barrel down around this mandrel until the rifling is formed by compressing the bore in. So the button pushes the lands and the rifling out. The hammer forge process hammers the barrel down around a mandrel. So the, the idea there that it's longer lasting is uh, the theory that you're compressing the, uh, the metal at the point where it comes in contact with the projectile. So it's this hard, hard worked, cold worked metal with compressed molecules. So that's hammer forging. Um, Not to get technical. Oh, no, yeah, just a little bit. We're talking about <laughs> molecules now. But, you know, it can make a very precise barrel. It's most commonly seen in machine gun barrels mm-hmm. it, for its reported long life. But it, but they can make a styre makes a fantastic hammer forged rifle barrel that is very precise. So uh, that can be done. We use single point cut rifling. Uh, this is a process that you will see on most bench rest rifles, long range competition rifles. This process takes a, the round hole that we started with on the other blanks, but instead of pushing or squishing the metal out or hammering the metal down, no stress is induced. There is a rod with a small cutter on it, and this is why it's called single point cutting, and it cuts every single groove in a spiral in the spiral form of the rifling, mm-hmm. one groove at a time. It takes it takes longer. I was going to say that's got to be a, just an arduous process. And it's so worth it. Oh, it I can so imagine. It. It's it's they're the most beautiful hand lapped single point cut rifle. Now barrels. you're making me want. You should have brought some barrels in so we could have fondled them during the show. Well, hey, we could tell everybody we are right now. Yeah, that's that's kind of true. One, David, Chris, put your shirt back on. Oh, okay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, yeah. So don't challenge me. Yeah, we we gotta we gotta like my producers going. No, don't go that way. No, <laughs> I don't talk about that. So the length of the Rec Seven barrel. Do you have different lengths, or are you only doing sixteens? Or no, we have a um, we have a full suite of carbines. So we've got the sixteen inch. That's our our standard Rec Seven. That's kind of the best all around recon rifle. We have a very short nine point five inch, uh, like a personal defense weapon SBR. And now we are also producing an eighteen inch heavy barreled designated marksman's rifle. And it uses a single point cut rifle stainless barrel on that rifle. Okay, so why why have a heavy barrel? What does the the heaviness, the weight of that barrel do for the long range? Why not just take your sixteen 
inch barrel mm. with the same thickness and weight and make it 18. The, What's the difference there? The, the heavier barrel that has more mass, more metal around the bore, it dissipates heat better because so there's you're using it, it, it like fluting on a barrel Sim, similar process yes and sometimes we flute these but the, the the actual metal mass is what helps that barrel respond more slowly to the heat cycle when you're firing a long string of fire mm -hmm. so if i uh, put in a 20 round magazine and a 556 and it has a really skinny pencil barrel that barrel is going to get hot really quick very fast and the point of impact of the bullets can shift, that was just, yeah. right? And the heavy barrel is just more resistant. It, mm -hmm. it, it it moves and heats up and changes at a slower rate. I got gotcha. you. So, would you go over eighteen inches ever on a five five six? Well, I mean, you know, there's there's, there's some twenties out there that I see some people make. You know, I love the classic. I actually love the classic twenty inch M sixteen rifle. Mm -hmm. it, you know, if you're a newcomer to shooting, you probably haven't shot one of those because nobody offers them anymore. But when I was a kid, that's what an M sixteen or an AR fifteen was. Right, and if you now pick up one of those rifles and all you've ever handled is this new crop, you'll, you're going to say, wow, this thing is light. And, hey, it feels really solid with that fixed buttstock. And mm -hmm. when I shoot it, it recoils really nice, and it's, it's fun to shoot. So if you haven't been able to to shoot a classic 20-inch A2 or A4 rifle, you've got to do that. It, it's uh, find, find a friend or a friend's dad that's got one. I just, buy, get out, one. just, just buy, buy one, right? One. Yeah. All right. So if we're looking at... Where you are today with what you're doing in your manufacturing process, if you can talk and maybe you can't, major changes that you guys have made, um, are you Cerakoting? Are you doing CNC now? Where where are you guys in the kind of upgrade process that you kind of mentioned a little bit about? So our manufacturing process changes daily. And uh, our, our VP of operations and engineering, uh, Jared Irvin, uh, I was telling you about him. He comes from the automotive world and, and, and many other businesses, has really challenged us and pushed us forward here. We have brought in so many uh, so many more processes that we used to sub out. We've brought in so many things now, and, and you know we've so been. You're using, doing most stuff in house now. Yes, we really are, and you know we've been using CNC machines for years and years since I was there. Mm -hmm. Truthfully, in '97 or '98, we already had CNC machines. Okay, fantastic. But it was nothing like what we are now. the The building now is like eighty thousand square foot full of, full of this stuff, and uh, we're now cellularizing a lot of our manufacturing processes. So we have manufacturing machining cells that do barrels for instance that's one of the ones that we're really proud of now we we do almost every operation on the barrel again it's the heart of the rifle we want to control every process there and that's done in, that's done in our barrel manufacturing cell that's fantastic where is because i mean we did not have enough time tonight with you and i have to have you back on air because there's a million more things that i want to find out and get across and it, you know, some, some shows when we have a really good show like this and we really get a lot of good information, it's almost a good thing. We don't have a lot of callers, right? Yeah. Because a lot of shows have callers that they pay or what have you to call in. And I think it interrupts the show and you don't get the value out of the guests that you have. So really quick, where are you guys going? Are do you do 300 blackout? Are you going into 300 blackout? We will have a 300 blackout by by shot show we're expanding the rec seven line to do some a lot fantastic. of fantastic we will we will have that it's been a big request um the the biggest new thing for barrett that i can talk about is our um is our new lightweight machine gun so we have really taken we've taken the u.s can i have one? Oh well <laughs> you might do you have twenty thousand dollars <laughs> So it's. Uh, I think it's. I think there's some other laws there, there that there play. Might, there, there's a little paperwork involved. I'm not a military guy. I don't. You know. I'm gonna have to sign myself up and be a salesperson for Barrett. So that allows me to have a machine gun in my house at all times. Right. Right. Just kidding. But we just. You know. We have ideas. We see things. Much like. Mm -hmm. Much in the same way that we got in with the Rec Seven and the AR platform. You know. We saw a real need there. In fact, the military had a, had a requirement to lighten the 240 machine gun. It's a fantastic gun. The USM240B and G and H and all the different versions they have, but it's just heavy. So it, now you've come out with a light version of that gun. Right. That's you know, amazing. Dad started looking at the thing um, and said, hey, you know, why Why does this thing have like 56 rivets in the receiver? We don't make guns like that anymore. You know, John Browning is a genius, but he's gone. And, and you know, we don't rivet things It's a new day. Way. It's a new day. We have CNC machines. If he had had the machines we have... 
this is the way it would have been done. But, you know, sometimes people just don't question that, and we just keep making them that way because they've always been made that way. I think one of the major things is the innovation and how you look at things. I am so impressed with the process that you go through because I've had a little bit of time with you. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to know you a little bit, and I'm very thankful for that. I appreciate the process that you go through and what you've done and how you look when you walk around the shop or you have a gun or an idea and the thought that goes into that is not what you might normally think. And for people who get to know you and understand your thought process, they get it. Mm -hmm. They get your love of the product, of the gun, of improving upon a product that is already out there of creating something from scratch that nobody's ever created before like your dad did and having that motivation of, you know, that enjoyment and that, that 